Nowadays, we know that periarteritis, let's say a generalized non-suppurative vasculitis, but focused on arteries, is the typical key uh, lesion in PCV3. And then, of course, very importantly, to detect PCV3 ideally in those lesions. What happened, however, that the PCV3 uh, tools for diagnosing the disease are very limited all over the world. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me in our studios this week is Dr. Kim Segalis. Dr. Segalis is a full professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. And Dr. Segalis is associated with the Erta Cressa Research Center and has done much, much great research for the industry for many, many years. Dr. Segalis, thank you very much for coming back onto the podcast. And um, while it would shock me if there are people that are not familiar with your work, please, uh, let's give a little introduction to the audience to start with. Thank you very much, Clayton. A real pleasure to join the, this podcast. In fact, I have been working with swine diseases in the last 30 years. This means that they have an age, so we are getting older, definitely. And anyway, during that time, I have been working with a number of special infectious diseases because I started with my PhD with PERS and Glacerella Paris Suisse. But soon when I started the famous PMWS, the post-winning multisystemic wasting syndrome, I started working with uh, porcine circovirus type 2. And this means that uh, this is uh, far away in time because we started in 1997 and even today we are still working with this virus. However, by back in 2017 or 16, we started working as well with porcine circovirus 3 which is, uh, let's say, a kind of similar virus to PCV2, but not that similar. And there are a number of differences in there. Well, I think that's where we want to chat today, Keem, is porcine circovirus 3. Um, we previously had a good conversation on porcine circovirus 2, and our audience can certainly look through the, the back catalog to reference that as needed. Uh, but PCV3, um, Keem, let's start with, um, you know, maybe the clinical signs, the disease progression. As you said, it is like related to PCV2, but not very close. Um, do we see big differences in the clinical expression of disease with PCV3 or is it pretty similar to PCV2? Yeah, in fact, I believe there's some confusion over there about those two viruses because uh, in spite of being part of the same uh, genus, the Porcian circovirus, they are fairly different viruses. I mean, if you want to compare at the genomic level, the similarity is no more than 50% on the whole genome. So from this point of view, they are completely different viruses. So this implies something which is very, very important, which is the fact that when one thing is thinking on vaccinating against PCB2, I'm not really vaccinated against PCV3. So that must be very clear from this point of view. So this implies that PCV3 is nowadays uh, an ubiquitous virus. In fact, it's as ubiquitous as PCV2 almost. So it's where, and I would say that so far, I have never found the farm in which PCV3 is not circulating, but capability of causing a disease, at least overt disease, seems to be very limited. However, the, the real thing is that we do not know exactly how important it is as yeah. a disease. How about diagnosis, um, Keem? If there is a producer who wants to understand, you know, is PCV3 an opportunity for my farm or my pig flow, how would you recommend them to go about that evaluation, knowing that it is ubiquitous and every producer who goes to look for it, they will find it, right? But how do they make that distinction of, okay, I found it, but uh, is it a problem or not? Yeah, th this is the key question, Clayton, because uh, probably, uh, and this is one of the similarity with PCB2, we have developed a very kind of a stringent diagnostic criteria for, for the disease because certainly we are very interested in observing certain clinical signs in which, at least with PCB3, the reproductive problems uh, related sometimes with late-term abortions or uh, weak-born piglets or sometimes some stillborns uh, is the most classical uh, preclinical presentation. This is one of those criteria, but there are two more criteria, which is the presence of histopathological lesions which are compatible with such infection, 
And for example, nowadays we know that periarteritis, let's say a generalized non-superative vasculitis, but for Houston arteries is the typical key uh, lesion in PCV3. And then of course, very importantly to detect PCV3 ideally in those lesions. What happened, however, that the PCV3 uh, tools for diagnosing the disease are very limited all over the world. Very few laboratories in the world, they are performing uh, techniques to detect the PCV3 in those lesions, normally by means of in situ hybridization. But such in situ hybridization, first, is very expensive. Second, very few laboratories in the world, they are performing it. So impl this implies that most of the people, in order to know if PCV3 is involved or not in a problem, is by means of PCR, quantitative PCR. However, is what you said, this is an ubiquitous virus. So which is the, the value, the worth of a PCR positive result when we are talking about an ubiquitous virus? Then the viral load here is important. And unless you don't find high amount of virus in particular farms in which some clinical signs compatible with the reproductive problems mainly are observed, then it's very difficult to establish a diagnosis. You need those tools. What about sequencing, Kim? Um, do you see many people sequencing PCV3 strains? Do we know how much about the genetic variability there is out there? Like with PCV2, we talk about 2A, 2B, 2D, right? Are there subcategories for PCV3 or it is just still not known because we don't have enough sequences? Well, a few years ago, I would uh, have to say that the variability of PCV3 was much more limited compared to PCV2 in the sense that uh, when we establish sound criteria together with a number of scientists all, all over the world in order to set um, clear-cut criteria for, the, uh, for at least establishing the genotype definition for PCV3, in fact, the idea was one single genotype at that time, which was named as PCB3A. However, of course, the time goes by, the number of sequences are increasing, and probably nowadays we have more than one genotype. However, even there's one, more than one genotype, it looks like that the variability of this virus is much, much lower compared to PCB2. So I'm not saying that my new genotypes will be uh, described uh, in the short term. In fact, some papers already are proposing some different genotypes mm -hmm. for PCV3, two or three, sometimes even uh, in such situation. But I believe it's too early to categorize in clear-cut, unequivocal different genotypes. Anyway, in all cases, probably we are always talking about the same serotypes. So uh, I'm pretty sure that those potential different genotypes are able to generate a common kind of immune response. Yeah. Well, the, so the immune response leads to the next, next natural question. If it's a fairly conserved virus, you know, one serotype, we think maybe, um, and it, it is ubiquitous, do you think in our future, Kim, we will have a commercial vaccine? We will have something that a producer can use to say, if you think you have a problem, here is a way to create immunity. Well, I'm pretty sure that, of course, I, I don't have a crystal ball to, to guess what will happen, but uh, PCB2 uh, make us learning something which is very important, which is the, the impact of the subclinical infection. Of course, we are always worried because of the overt signs. So what's uh, up into the iceberg. You, you never know what's be, uh, below the iceberg. And with PCV3, we are exactly in the same situation. What does it mean, a subclinical infection with PCV3? Is jeopardizing our production parameters or not? In fact, we do not really know. Of course, if you have to look for the visible part of the iceberg with PCV3, it's clear that it's not similar to PCV2 because more than 25 years ago, we started with a tremendous devastating disease, while with PCV3, it has never been something like that. I'm pretty sure that some cases can be diagnosed as PCV3 and probably a vaccine mm -hmm. may help in counteracting those effects. However, of course, a generalized need for this vaccine is probably not that clear. Might be in the future because this is something which is coming, and especially after COVID-19, it's very, very clear that as long as we can make autogenous vaccines or alternatively vaccines based on mRNA, for example, which can to a certain degree to make a kind of tailor-made vaccine for particular farms, I'm pretty sure that PCV3 could be a very interesting target to be controlled in the future. Yep. 
So is it a, a, a okay summary, Keem, to say that, um, yeah, the, the potential to make a vaccine is, is there, maybe, but uh, the need, I don't know, don't know if there is a need, right? I think you draw a great distinction with PCV2. We find it because there's a huge problem, right? There, the, the iceberg could not be missed. The iceberg, whether it is the top or the bottom, it hit us hard. Um, and PCV3, we have been monitoring for quite some time now, and we have not seen that huge wave like we did with PCV2. The same thing could happen in the future where there is some evolution of the virus or some evolution of the host that makes it more susceptible, right? Uh, but but um, until we get to that point, probably not going to see tremendous investment in vaccine production uh, simply because, you know, today most producers would say, ah, it is not an immediate need for me. Exactly. At the very end, there's no uh, market need at present because it's not a generalized problem. As long as the things may change, of course, might be the manufacturing pharma companies might be interested in developing a product. However, we must confess that we are in a situation which is not ideal because nowadays PCB3 is a very hard virus to be isolated. So we do not have a systematic uh, way of isolating the virus. So at least something as simple, well, as simple, it's not uh, never simple, but anyway, to get an inactivated vaccine that could be uh, a kind of uh, product to, to be launched. But anyway, we do not have isolates worldwide no. almost. Even uh, when you have been trying to express the proteins, for example, like a baculovirus express yeah. system, etc., it has been quite, quite okay. complicated. So it looks like that nowadays, at least, to follow the same pathway that we have been following for PCV2 is not that obvious, probably for the reason other platforms based on RNA or something like that would have be or would be much more successful in the future. But anyway, is what you said. We, we first need that people believe that this virus is causing something and apply it. But I insist we don't have any idea about the subclinical impact with, the, with this virus. Very good. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Team, it's uh, reassuring to me and I know to many people in the swine industry to hear your expertise, to know you are monitoring these sorts of issues. And if we see some shifts that we have a great ability to respond as quickly as possible to try and solve whatever problems come in the future. Thank you so much for, for coming on today and sharing this information and for everything you do to help make all of us more educated decision makers when it comes to managing the health of our pigs. My, my real pleasure, Clayton. I really hope it could be useful for, for, the, uh, for the listeners. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Keem. Uh, we look forward to hope, having you come back in the near future. Uh, and to our audience, thank you as always for joining us. Um, we really appreciate uh, you listening in every single week. If you have not checked out our website at swinehealthblackbelt.com, please go do so. Uh, for Dr. Keem Sigalis, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thank you very much for joining us and please have a great rest of your day. Hey everybody, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.